Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at my sixth round game here in Norway chess against none other than Alireza Gucci Ferruja. Now as you guys know I won a very big game in round number five with the white piece against Ariantari and today I have the black piece against Ferruja. A very big game in terms of second ranking in the world as well as the overall tournament standings here in Norway chess. So let's jump right into the action. So Ali Reza is a white piece and he opens with e4. Now true to form, I decided to play the Sicilian here. Now of course I played both e5 and c5 in multiple games here, but I felt like based on the tournament standings, I want to play a little bit more on the edge. So Ali Reza plays knight f3. I play knight to c6 and now he plays bishop G bishop to b5. And of course we have the classic Rosalimo opening. Here I choose to play the move g6 once again. Ali Reza castles, bishop g7. He trades, rook e1, queen c7. And now Ali Reza plays the move knight to a3. Now up to this point, we were following the game that I had just two rounds ago against Anish Giri. But here Ali Reza deviates with this move knight to a3. Now the reasoning behind knight a3 is quite simple. White still wants to play for c3 and d4 in the center, but he's arguing that the knight can jump to c4 and then potentially towards e5 or a5 or say if i play e5 the knight on c4 puts a lot of pressure immediately on this pawn here so ali reza goes to the goes to the edge of the board of this knight but he wants to bring it back very very quickly so after knight to a3 i play this new move knight to h6 now, of course, when I prepared this variation a couple of days ago for Anish Giri, I did look at this move, knight to h6, and it's an original move. It has never been played before. Now, to be clear, knight a3 is in and of itself almost a novelty. They're very limited games thus far, but knight h6 really takes us off the beaten path. Now, after going knight to h6, you're probably wondering, well, what are you doing? You're both putting your knights on the rim. Or did you guys forget basic rules of chess? Like, what's going on here? Now, the reason that I put my knight on the rim is twofold. First of all, I can potentially play for f5 here. So, say white just wastes some time with knight b1, knight a3. I can play f5. The knight supports the pawn push, and I open up the f file. Additionally, I can also play knight g4 and put pressure towards this pawn on h2 as well. So, that's the reasoning behind me playing knight to h6. Now, Ali Reza used a bunch of time here before playing C3. He uses 26 minutes. Now, obviously, with no increment, you do have to be careful about how much time you're going to use on the first 40 moves before you do get that 10-second increment. But I was very surprised to see how long Ali Reza took. Now, this was still in my preparation here. I decided to castle. Ali Reza plays H3. Now, H3 is a prophylactic move here by Ali Reza. And the reason he did it is that if he plays D4 right away, after takes, takes, and D5 here, if white plays E5, I can go Bishop G4, pinning the knight on F3. If white tries to break the pin with h3 after takes, takes knight to f5, suddenly my knight is jumping very, very quickly into the game. And after white plays moves like knight c2, I can immediately go c5. And already here, white has problems with his pawn chain on d4 and e5. The knight is putting pressure on the pawn on d4, and black has no issues whatsoever. So Ali Reza plays h3 here, and now I play this move f6. Now here, if I were to play d5 in one go, now white can play a move like d3. <clears throat> simply opening up the diagonal for the bishop or even e5 f6 and then d4 and as you'll notice in this position with the pawn on h3 i can no longer go bishop g4 and thus the knight on f3 is very well placed protecting the pawns on d4 and e5 here so i play f6 ali reza plays d4 we trade the pawns and now i play d5 trying to take a bit of the center myself now here white has pawns on e4 and d4 but i have a pawn on d5 so it remains relatively balanced here, Ali Reza plays bishop d2 after another long think of nearly six minutes. Now, as you'll notice, this is the first new position for me. At this point, I've used five minutes, and this is all preparation. Now, without going too deep into the weeds, I had looked at a couple of different moves here besides bishop d2, one of the most prominent ones being pawn takes pawn, as well as this move knight to b1. Ali Reza instead plays bishop d2, and now I go into my first real think of the game. Now, after quite a bit of a think, I end up playing this move queen b7, and there are three reasons that I played this move. Now, it turns out that in this position, probably I should have played bishop to e6 with the idea of creating the classic wooden shield in the middle of the board here with the bishop on d5. Now, I didn't play bishop e6, so I was actually a little bit worried about this queen c1 move creating a potential right triangle here for white. And after I moved the knight to f7, keeping the knight, knight guarded, now I thought that maybe white could go knight b5, queen d7, and then knight c3. And I was very worried here that based on the structure with the bishop and these pawns here, this sort of, uh, I don't I think it's called a reverse bathtub formation, I was worried that white's getting a knight to c5, either via e4 or a4. Now, as it turns out, after takes, takes bishop d5, knight c5, and say queen to f5, black is already perhaps a little bit better here. But again, without knowing the exact computer line, it's very hard to go for this. And my thought process was that in this position, when I play queen b7, 
I want to play against this poorly placed knight. But what I would really like to have here is a knight on c3 where it pressures the pawn on d5 or knight to a4 and knight to c5 here with a classic bastion. So my thought process after bishop d or after um <clears throat> bishop d2 queen to b7 is threefold. First of all, I dodge any threats on the c file. No threats towards the pawn on c6 or the queen on c7. For example, like if I played some random moves, you'll notice that the queen and the pawn are very, very weak. So by going queen to b7, I sidestep any threats on the c file. Additionally, I threaten to win a free pawn on b2 potentially. And last but not least, I also stop white from playing bishop to b4. So if I were to go knight f7, perhaps white can play a move like bishop b4, trying to put a lot of pressure towards this pawn on e7 here. And black is okay after rook e8, but white can also place this bishop on c5, and you have another wooden shield here, and I think that white is doing okay. So I try to follow the basics here, and I think, you know what, queen b7, stop bishop b4, target the pawn, keep the knight at bay, knight can't jump back into the game. Now here, Ali Reza plays e5, and now I go knight to f7. I'd love to take the pawn, but after knight takes here, suddenly white is this great knight on e5. I have this big weakness on e7 down the road, and white is clearly better. So I play knight to f7. Ali Reza goes knight to c2, and now I play this move bishop to f5 after a bit of a thing. Now I'd love to capture the juicer on b2 here, and maybe it's not losing on the spot, but after knight to b4, my queen is in a lot of trouble. These pawns on c6 and d5 are very weak. If I try to guard them with, say, bishop d7, there's a fork with e6 here, and that's gg, why not? And if I play a move like knight t8 to guard the pawns on c6 and d5, now I think white can simply play this move a3, and my queen is getting trapped here, because when I play a5, white can simply go rook to a2, Knight guards the pawn, queen guards the square, knight guards the rook, GG. So, I decided to play bishop f5, and again, this is based on themes here. In this position, I played bishop f5, so I felt like, whoops, and there we go. Spoiler, spoiler, sorry about that, you guys. In this position, I go bishop to f5 here, because I figure in this position, the bishop on c8 is very, very passive. It's not well placed. Maybe I could try to put on this a6 square with the queen in the way. I'd have to move the queen just to get the bishop here. So I bring my bishop into the game. I'm still keeping pressure towards this pawn on e5. And now the bishop on f5 can target the knight on c2. Here, Ali Reza decides to play pawn takes pawn on f6. And now I play pawn takes pawn. Now, this is a move I played after a bit of a think. And I think already at this point, my evaluation was a little bit jaded by the fact that I was up 40 plus minutes on the clock. And I think it affected my overall objective evaluation of the position. Because I, I was already thinking around this point that I was a little bit better. And I wanted to play for more, try to put pressure on him on the clock, try to win this game in classical. And so I ended up taking with the pawn on f6. Now, I think in retrospect, probably I should have taken with the bishop here. And after white plays move like bishop c3, I think I can go bishop e4, knight to d2 and now i go knight d6 and with this great bishop targeting pawn on d4 ideas like bishop h4 here i don't think i have any issues whatsoever if white trades a knight knight for the bishop suddenly i get this classic connect four here the knight on e4 is very very well placed and black is a little bit better so i think in retrospect i should have taken with the bishop but i felt like i'm up on time i really want to keep pieces on the board try to try to create something dynamic so I take with a pawn, and now Ali Reza plays rook c1 pretty quickly, and this is where I start to go wrong in a hurry. Now, at this point, for whatever reason, I thought here that I could play this move bishop to e4, and I thought that after bishop b4, rook to e8, or not bishop b4, sorry, after knight to b4, I could go rook fc8, but now I was actually quite worried about this move queen to a4, because now suddenly the pawn on c6 is under a lot of pressure here, and even though I can trade the bishop for the knight and white gets these stacked pawns, I really can't guard this pawn on c6 very easily. Now, of course, the computer just laughs and says, play bishop f8, knight takes c6, and the superhuman and obvious move, pawn to a6 here, and nobody cares. But again, for us humans, playing something like this is simply insane, and there's no way I can do that. So I play a5 trying to stop this knight before idea, and now Ali Reza plays b4 quickly, and now I start to start to sort of lose the thread of the game. Now already here, you have to keep in mind that I've seen to myself, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, and I'm better. And so when he starts playing his moves like rook c1 and b4, I am thinking, I must have made a mistake, I've done something wrong, and that's why I'm not much better anymore. Now as I said, I think the fact that Ali Reza used so much time was starting to cloud my judgment and how I was feeling about the overall position. So here I play a4 after quite a long thing, and I hated myself for having to play a4 here. I really did not want to play a4 primarily because in this position, now the pawn on b4 is a strength here. It's guarded. But if white moves the knight, suddenly the c6 pawn is weak. And furthermore, after white gets a3 in here, suddenly the a4 pawn is weak. And these pawns on a3 and b4 are very solid here. So for that reason, I was already very unhappy about having to play a4, but I simply did not see a better move. 
After a4, Ali Reza plays bishop f4, an excellent move to stop me from jumping with the knight. If I could get one more turn here and get knight d6, for example, suddenly the knight is going to b5, c4, e4, and black has no issues at all. But when, when Ali Reza plays bishop f4, now the knight can't go to d6. If it can't go to d6, how does it ever get to any of these squares? Can't ever really go to g5 because that loses the pawn. And so bishop f4 is an all-star move here. And now my knight on f7 has some problems. So here I play rook fd8. Ali Reza goes a3 to protect his pawn structure on the queen side. And now I play this move knight d6. Now this move is sort of rooted in a little bit of panic and just sort of not knowing what to do here. Already, I had a, I felt like I'd done something wrong. I was worried about the end games due to this pawn structure with the weak pawn on a4. And I thought, you know what? I, the only really great idea is to go knight d6, knight e4, knight c4, knight b5. And I did briefly consider this g5 move, which the computer likes. But after bishop, takes, bishop to h2, I thought that here, if anybody is better, it's white. I feel like I'm creating some weaknesses on the king side, and I don't really see how to proceed. Now, of course, the computer says after bishop e4, knight d2, I can simply go bishop g6, and I'm fine. But I was a little bit worried that after knight to e3, Three, there's some pressure towards the pawn on c6 if i play a move like rook to e8 i was even concerned about g4 followed by knight to f5 and again with these two weak pawns on c6 and a4 it just did not feel right to me so i end up playing knight d6 now this is simply a bad move because when i play knight d6 all the rest of goes knight e3 and now I have to play this move bishop to e6. Now, again, I was very upset with myself for having to play this because I wanted to go bishop to e4. But what I actually miscalculated, or maybe I didn't, was I thought that Ali Reza could trade the bishop for the knight and then play knight to c4, attacking the rook here. And if I take the knight, he takes the bishop, and now my pawns are absolutely horrible on c6, c4, and a4. And if I play bishop takes f3, there's knight takes rook. And after bishop takes queen, knight takes queen, white has two rooks and a knight, and I have a rook and two bishops, so white is completely winning. Additionally, I thought that after rook to e6 and knight to a5, suddenly white's creating a fork here, attacking both the queen and the pawn at the same time. And I thought that after queen d7 and a move like queen takes a4, I was in a lot of trouble. But apparently the computer says that after this bishop h6 move, black is completely fine because on rook c3 you have bishop f4 and suddenly there's some threats towards the white king now of course when i calculated it's the only line i looked at was bishop bishop takes knight and after takes takes pawn takes bishop i thought that i was simply losing here because when i take the juicer on h3 there's queen takes pawn pawn and the rook are both under attack and after i go rook d8 there's now knight to b7 i can no longer guard the pawn and just like that after king h8 knight d6 even though white's king is a little bit open here it's completely winning because you can just push p on the queen side so that's what I had calculated, and I just wasn't convinced, so I ended up going bishop to e6 instead. And now Ali Reza trades and goes rook to e2. And already here, I was very, very unhappy, because even though I have a small time advantage, white has all the trumps in the position, pun intended, because I have the weak pawn on a4, I have the weak pawn on c6, and white can also try to plop a pony on c5 via e1 and d3. And I don't really have a lot of activity here. I'm tied down to defending these two pawns. And unless I'm given a lot of time, it's going to be hard to start pushing pawns on the king side here. Nonetheless, you have to keep playing on. So here I go queen b6, and the reasoning behind this move is that I want to stop Ali Reza from being able to go knight e1 and knight e3 immediately, because then I would eat the juicer on d4. And if white tries to put the rook on c5 first, I can now go bishop to f8, and later on after knight e1, I can go rook d7, rook c3, and bishop f7. Again, you can't go knight d3, the bishop covers a square, and even though white is still better here... I'm trying to hang on. So Ali Reza goes queen c2. Now, this is the first move that to me felt kind of wrong. The computer likes this move queen to d2, but I felt like in this position already here, white should be trying to make a beeline for the queen side with knight to e1 potentially, or even a move like rook e to c2. But when he goes queen c2, this felt a little bit wrong to me because the queen's never really the piece that you want attacking this pawn on c6 here. And additionally, now you can no longer stack the rooks on the c file. So I played bishop d7. He goes rook c to e1, and now I play rook to e6. He goes knight d1. We trade the rooks, and now I play bishop to f8. Now, again, it's a very unpleasant position to play here because white can put the knight on either b2 or c3, and I have this permanent weakness on a4 here, and so the rook is tied down to it. Additionally, the knight on f3 can potentially be maneuvered down the road as well. So say, say we get some position like this, for example. If white can magically start maneuvering his other knight into the game with knight to c5, white is much, much better here. So white has a lot of ideas. Additionally, I have another big conceptual problem here, which is that I cannot push this pawn to open up the diagonal because then I yield the square on e5. So it's a very hard position to play here. And already I didn't feel very good, but again, you just got to keep playing on. So here I go bishop to f8. 
All I Reza plays knight b2. I go queen to b5 here. Now, knight b2, the reason that All I Reza played knight b2 instead of knight c3 is that he wants to keep an eye on the pawn on a4, but he also potentially wants to go to d3 and c5, whereas on c3, you target the pawn, but there's no way to get to the square. So knight b2 is a dual, dual purpose move. So I go queen b5. He plays queen d2, and now I go bishop d6. He plays knight h2. Now, this, I think, was also a mistake here. I was very concerned about knight d3 because if I play a move like bishop to f8, white can go knight c5 here. And now you might think, well, takes, takes, and something like rook to e8, and you're completely fine where you control the open b file. But the problem is if I trade the bishop for the knight, now white takes with the d pawn, and you get this huge bastion with the knight on d4 here, and white is simply much better. So I was very concerned about knight d3, but then Ali Reza played knight to h2, and now I want queen b8, and here he inexplicably played knight f1. Now again, I was very, very concerned about this move knight to g4 here, because suddenly there were big threats towards the pawn on f6, and in this position, if I play a move like queen to f8, for example, I thought that white could go queen c2. And suddenly, I don't know how I'm guarding this pawn on a4. And if I trade the bishop for the knight here after takes, I have to worry about rook e6. So when I play queen c8 and queen to e2 is played, white guards the pawn on g4. There's an infiltration threat with queen to e6. And I thought after king f7, queen to f3, this is really hard to play. White's threatening g5. White's threatening b5 as well. White also has rook c1. And I think it's very, very difficult to play. Now, it's interesting to note the computer doesn't think it's all that bad, but for a human with limited time on the clock, this would have been absolutely miserable. Fortunately, Ali Reza goes knight to f1, and now I play king g7. He plays knight e3, and now I start pushing on the king side by going h5. Ali Reza plays knight to d3 after a bit of a think. I think Ali Reza initially wanted to go knight e to d1 here, but the problem with playing knight e d1 and knight c3, which looks quite good, is that after I play a move like bishop f5, White can always take the juicer on a4, but after you take, I go queen b5, knight c3, and now I simply go back to a6. And you have this problem where you can never push the a pawn without losing the b pawn, and you can't go knight b1 to guard because then I will trade the bishop for the knight and win the pawn on a3. So this pawn on a4 isn't really a, a, it isn't really a threat for white to capture it. So I think that was our, Ali Reza's initial idea, but then he decides to go for another plan once he realizes it's not working. He plays knight to d3. Now here I go queen c8. Now this move is a bit of a bluff here. What I'm what I'm basically saying to Ali Reza is that if he plays a move like knight c1, I can potentially sack the bishop for the pawn. And after he takes my bishop, I have all kinds of threats with bishop to h2 or queen h2. And white probably should make a draw with knight f1, queen g4. And now after king to h1, we just check back and forth. And that's all she wrote. So Ali Reza here decides to play h4, and now after bishop to e6, I started to feel quite confident about my position. Not in terms of me being better, but in terms of me being able to save the game. Because now if white ever goes g3, suddenly you have to worry about threats on these light squares in addition to threats on the dark squares as well. And it's just very hard to play. And if you play with like rook c1, there might even be something like queen to e8 followed by queen to e4 with my own infiltration. And it just st it starts to feel very difficult to play, and black is getting a lot of counterplay. And as a sample line, say white plays move like queen b2, now suddenly there's also bishop takes g3, and just like that, white's the one who's in a lot of trouble. So when I played bishop e6, I actually offered Ali Reza a draw here. We were both down to about nine minutes. It's getting very dicey here with no increment yet. And I felt that once he had played h4, g3 would be very difficult to play. So I offered a draw sort to get a feel or a feel for the room temperature or to see how he felt about his position as well. So Ali Reza declines and plays on with knight c5. I go bishop f7. Queen c2, and now I play rook to a7 here. Another very good move, because now I sort of have the optimal setup. The bishop on d6 is perfectly placed. Bishop on f7 is well placed, guarding the pawns. And I can even try to go rook e7 and claim the e-file down the road. Also worth noting, white cannot take the pawn once again on a4, because after knight takes a4, I simply play queen to a8. And when you move the knight back to c5, I have rook takes a3. And black is already a little bit better here. So, excuse me. Sorry, I just finished my dinner. Um, so in this position, Ali Reza can't really take the pawn here, and he doesn't have a whole lot of ideas. So he plays rook to c1, and now I go bishop to f4, pinning this knight here, and I have an idea down the road, which is if white plays a move like queen d1, maybe I can trade and even go bishop to e6 here, and after queen f3, bishop to f5, suddenly black is completely fine, because while I have this very beautiful knight on c5, it's not targeting anything, and I can play queen to e8 and rook to e7 in the next couple of moves, and with this active bishop on the light squares, Black has no issues whatsoever. So here, Ali Reza plays knight d3. 
and now I play bishop d6 back, and Alirez plays knight c5 and offers me a draw. Worth noting that if he were to capture the pawn on c6, now I can play rook c7, lining up the double stack on the file, and after queen takes bishop, rook takes rook, knight takes rook, queen takes knight, king to h2, queen takes a3. White probably has to make a draw with knight takes pawn, bishop takes, queen takes, queen b4, and then something like queen d7, king f8, queen d8, and queen d7, infin add infinitum, and the game will end in a draw. So instead, Ali Reza plays knight c5, offers me a draw, and I choose to accept the draw. Now, this is a very difficult decision because I had six minutes. I had about six, six minutes and 50 seconds. He had about three minutes on the clock, and I really wasn't sure should I take the draw or should I try to play on. Now, the equation that was going on in my mind was twofold. First of all, I saw Fabiano's game against Noderbeck, and I thought Noderbeck was okay in that game, if not a little bit better. As it turns out, I was completely wrong. Noderbeck was actually worse by then, and he would go on to lose the game. Now, setting that aside for a second, so I was thinking about position, I thought Noderbeck was okay. Additionally, I was trying to figure out, well, this is a tough spot, because basically I can play on here, the game is very complicated, and maybe Ali Reza will blunder with a 10 second increment. We can play a game of Blitz, where basically play a classical game of Blitz, I should say, because the classical rankings are affected, and maybe things go my way, maybe they don't. So I was thinking about it more and more, and I felt that if Ali Reza had maybe a minute on the clock or a little bit under a minute, I do think I would have continued to play on. But with Ali Reza having three minutes, I do have to be mindful of the fact that if I play one bad move as well, I will just lose the game too, even though I have three more minutes. So I end up making the practical decision, and the game ends in a draw. All right, so now let's move on to, of course, the second game, which is our classic our Megadon game. Now, Ali Reza has the white pieces in 10 minutes. Must win the game with the white pieces. And I, of course, have seven minutes and the black pieces. If I don't lose the game, I get an extra half point. We both get one point, as I've said in previous videos. One point for drawing the classical game. Half point up for grabs. So, Ali Reza opens with E4 again. And this time, I play E5. Following the same pattern that I played against Anish Giri before, where I played Sicilian in the regular game. And then I played E5 in the Blitz game. So we get knight f3, knight c6, and Gucci Reza plays the Gucci piano, of course, true to style with bishop c4. Knight f6, d3, bishop c5, c3, d, c3, a6, all pretty standard so far. We got bishop g5, d6, knight bd2. I play bishop a7 here to dodge any d4, b4 threats with a tempo on the bishop. So Ali Reza castles, I play h6, bishop h4, and now I castle out of the center. Here he plays b4, I go g5, and now he plays this move bishop g3, and here I play king to g7. Now it's worth noting that while I had not studied this before the game, this is a variation that I've looked at for many, many years. I first started studying it prior to the candidates in 2016. I looked at it a lot with Peter Lecco. And so after bishop b3 is played, I found this nice move knight to h7 with the idea of playing h5 or f5. Here, Ali Reza plays knight c4, and now I just go all in on the king side by pushing h5, threatening h4, which would trap the bishop on g3. Ali Reza goes h4, I go g4, knight d2, and now I play f5. He takes the pawn, of course, because if he doesn't, here comes the avalanche of pawns, and they will definitely uh, crush crush the position here. I will win the game, and uh, there will be no issues whatsoever. So if I get the pawn avalanche, that's going to be gg. So Ali Reza takes, and now I play this move knight to e7 here with the idea of recapturing on f5 with my knight to target the bishop and the pawn. Ali Reza plays f6, I take back, goes knight e3, and now I just play knight to f5 here. Just a very classic move here to exchange the knight and keep the flow going. Already by this point, Ali Reza used a lot of time. I think I'd surprise him somewhere along the way. I don't know if he hadn't seen knight h7 or he was sort of just playing by feel. But already here, I was only down 30 seconds, and I was feeling really, really good about my position. So here, Ali Reza plays d4. Now, this is a move that I think Ali Reza played sort of based on the situation of needing to win the game and just not feeling very good about his position. Now, it's worth noting that after knight c4, bishop g6 here, White can probably play king h1 to try to play for f3 or maybe queen d2 to go queen g5. But even after queen d7 here, it's very hard for White to play because I can play rook e8, move my knight, and it's on White to prove a plan or to show a plan at least. And all I have to do is respond to his moves. So Ali Reza plays d4. I take, we trade, I play bishop d4, he goes rook c1, and I think what Ali Reza missed with this thematic pawn sacrifice in the center is that I can play bishop b2 going after the rook on c1, and the rook is very misplaced here. You can't go to c2 or b1 because I will simply capture the rook on either of these two squares, and so he plays rook c4. Now I go b5, plays rook f4, and I go bishop to g6 here, and now basically the plan is that I'm going to trap the rook with bishop to e5 next move, and it'll be gg. Why not? So Ali Reza plays rook to e1, 
And now I go bishop e5, trapping the rook on f4. He plays knight to f1. And here I play this move, queen d7. Now, this move was a blunder by me. Initially, I was just going to take the rook and after takes, play something like rook to e8 or knight to e4. But I felt that if Ali Reza could get a bishop to e3 here, even though black is much better, there are some tricks here because you've got this great bishop on d4, which can create some threats. There might even be something like queen c2 to hit the pawn, hit the knight. We, of course, have a classic right triangle as well. And so I did not want to allow the counterplay. So I used a bit of time, and then I played queen d7. Now, this was what I would call a lucky blunder, because I did not see the tactic that Ali Reza would unleash here. Now, because the position is so bad, the tactic actually doesn't work, but nonetheless, I missed it. So when I played queen d7, Ali Reza took the bishop, I take back, he takes my knight. If I recapture the rook, I lose the queen. Nobody wants to do a Botez gambit here, and I take the queen. Now, when I was calculating queen d7 before, the, before these moves were played, I saw rook takes f8, Queen takes knight, takes, and king takes f8. And here with a rook and bishop versus the two bishops, I'm just going to win this game. Much to my horror, of course, before Ali Reza played rook takes e5, I did realize that in this position, there's rook takes g6 check. And after king takes rook, bishop takes queen, white suddenly has three pieces for two rooks. Now, three pieces are not enough for two rooks here, but nonetheless, it was a blunder, and it's something that I probably would not have played if I had realized this tactic existed. Nonetheless, the show goes on. So here I play rook a d8 to attack the bishop. Bishop to e2, and now I play this move, rook to d5, which is a slight inaccuracy. What I should have played here was this beautiful, beautiful move, rook to f4, because now if white takes the rook, I sack the rook for the bishop, but white's knight and bishop are effectively dead. If white goes f3, I can play g3, and you'll notice the knight simply has no squares. Knight cannot move anywhere. So the knight is dead. The bishop is also dead. The bishop simply has no squares if we get to this position. You'll notice that the pawns cover these squares. Rook covers the file, and the knight can't move. Bishop can't move. And I will just simply walk my king all the way up, and then eventually win the pawn, and then push Pete down the board and win the game. So rook f4 would have been a beautiful move if I had spotted it. Of course, I didn't. But what I did spot was rook d5. And the reason this is good enough is because even though white has three pieces for the two rooks, if I can get rid of these pawns on the queen side, there is no chance of me ever losing the game. So after rook d5, Ali Reza plays f3. I take. He takes back with the pawn. Now, he probably should have taken with the bishop here. But again, I would have sacked the rook for the bishop. And after take, c5 here. Let's just say trade. There's, there's White probably has some drawing chance with knight to e3, rook c3, and king f2. But again, white can never win the game. And Ali Reza knew that, which is why he took with the pawn on f3. Now I go c5, exchanging some pawns on the queen side. We trade the pawns. He goes bishop d3. And now I go king to f6. Plays bishop f2. And now I go rook g8 check. He goes king h2. And now I play rook to c3. And white basically is unable to activate these three pieces here. And the two rooks are on open files. They're really, really active. And white is completely lost. So the game concludes with bishop to e4. Here I play rook to a3. Ali Reza plays bishop d5, attacking the rook and guarding his own pawn. But after rook d8, bishop b3, I now go rook d8 to d3 here, attacking the pawn and the bishop. And after knight g3, I simply sack the rook for the bishop here because I know that I'm going to have two pawns on the queen side that I can push, and the rest is simple. Here I take on b3, he goes king g2. If he were to take the pawn with check, I go king g6, knight g3. And then after rook takes f3, I should win this game pretty routinely. So he goes king g2, I go king g6 guarding the pawn, and now Ali Reza resigns in view of the fact that I'm just going to push this A pawn straight down the board, and there's really nothing that White can do here to stop that. In, in, in an absolute best case scenario, maybe I'll just make the draw, but there's no hope, and so Ali Reza simply decides to resign the game. And with that, I win the Armageddon game. I get the full one and a half points that I could have obtained after drawing the classical portion, and I'm now in clear second place. I think I'm two and a half points. Uh, behind Fabiano, or maybe it's two points, but I'm also two and a half points ahead of the third place player. So while Fabiano won his classical game and the gap increased, I'm still in the hunt. There's still three more rounds. I will definitely try to give it my best shot. We will see what happens, but at any rate, tomorrow I'm going to be playing with the white pieces in round number seven. Again, Shakri Ahmed Yarab, and make sure to stay tuned as I will obviously be doing another recap for you guys here on YouTube as soon as that game finishes. So once again, I hope you guys enjoyed this recap of round number six here at Norway. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already and i'll be back tomorrow with another great recap here live from norwich see you guys bye